Welcome back to Alex Academy, where in this video we're going to talk about Chapter 4 of Ansco U.S. History, Imperial Wars and Colonial Protests from 1753 to 1774. So the first thing we have is the Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War. And this was the fourth war in a series of wars fought by European powers of Britain, France, and Spain. Now this war really began in the colonies and then spread to Europe, but as I said before, there was fighting decades before, and this was the fourth out of a series of four wars fought between these European powers. Basically, in this war, a big thing shifted. For example, Britain and France really realized the importance of their colonies, so they started shipping large numbers of troops overseas to North America instead of relying on the colonial forces, which they deemed as amateur. And afterwards, the fighting really started heating up. The French provoked the war from the British point of view by building a chain of forts in the Ohio River Valley, while the British didn't, was trying to go westward, and the French did not like that. So finally, the last straw was sort of when the French were sort of finishing work on Fort Duquesne near modern day Pittsburgh. And with that, they would control the whole Ohio River Valley and the Brits really didn't like that. So the governor of Virginia sent a small militia and armed force under the command of young Colonel George Washington to try to go stop these people. And Washington's troops were doing fine at first, but then they eventually had to surrender. So this wasn't really great for our future nation's first president. And then there was another militia by General Edward Braddock who tried to do the same thing, but he got routed by the Algonquian allies as well. So in the beginning, the Seven Years' War wasn't looking up too well for the British. And because the British weren't doing really too well, there was this need for coordinating the colonies together for their own mutual defense. So there was the Albany Plan of Union, and it was developed by Ben Franklin. And basically, it was an intercolonial government and a system for recruiting troops and collecting taxes from the various colonies so that they could commonly defend each other. And it didn't really quite work out because the colonies didn't really want to come together. But it set a precedent for later when more revolutionary congresses were able to develop. And this is sort of an image of a snake where the colonies had to join together or be cut like this snake. Eventually, though, the Brits were able to fix their mistakes and they took back forts and cities occupied by French, such as Quebec and Montreal in Canada. And ultimately, the European powers decided to negotiate a peace treaty to end this fighting, and it was called the Peace of Paris in 1763. There are a lot of treaties of Paris's in history. And in this, basically, Great Britain acquired both French Canada and Spanish Florida, and France ceded or gave up to Spain its huge western territory, so around Louisiana and the Mississippi River Valley, around there. But in exchange, Spain also lost Florida to the British forces. And eventually, what happened was the British had control over all of North America, and France basically left while Spain only got the West and, of course, South America and Central America as they had previously. So this is sort of a map before and after. As you can see, these French forces originally here are no longer present here. So you really see how the French lost a lot in the French and Indian War. So right when the peace treaty was starting to be established, there was this test of the British imperial policy, and it came from Chief Pontiac, who was a Native American chief in 1763. And basically, the Indians he were leading were angered by the Western move movement of European settlers onto their land, and they didn't like it. And the Natives also didn't like that the British didn't give them the gifts as the French traders had done. So they were really pissed off. And as a result, Pontiac started to ally the Natives in the Ohio Valley, and they destroyed forts and settlements. But ultimately, the British just sent regular British troops, the Redcoats, and put down the uprising because, of course, they had superior weapons. So the British were actually kind of scared once Pontiac Rebellion happened. So they tried to stabilize the western frontier by saying that the colonists could not go west of the Appalachian Mountains. So they drew this like imaginary line. As you can see, it's outlined in red, but I'll highlight it in yellow. So they could not cross this line westward, and this line was really just the Appalachian Mountains. And the British government said this because they hoped that limiting settlements would prevent future uprisings like Pontiac's Rebellion. But the colonists really didn't like it because they wanted more land and they sort of needed it. So for the British to deny them, they really did not like it. And even though this proclamation occurred, many colonists still went over the line, defying British law. Stamp Act of 1965 was this act that was really trying to raise funds to support the British military forces because, of course, as you may recall, the French and Indian War and all those wars in Europe were really costly and the Brits really needed revenue. So the Stamp Act, enforced by Parliament in 1765, actually it was enacted, not really enforced quite yet, it required that revenue stamps be placed on most printed paper in the colonies, so like legal documents, newspaper, pamphlets, ad advertisements, anything with paper really. And this was really the concept of the direct tax. And the direct tax was that it was collected from people who used the goods, so not the people who were selling it. So like, you, you, you know, you might say like the merchants who sold the paper, they weren't being directly taxed. It was really the people who were consuming or using these 
tax and paper goods that were really being taxed. So aside from this, the people really did not like it, and they protested to it. One of them was Patrick Henry, who eventually we will also talk about. But as a result of this, they formed the Stamp Act Congress, and they the people really just vowed that they would say that only their own elected representatives could have the legal authority to tax, and this theme would come up later as well. You can also see here, this underlined in green is actually a teapot from Colonial Williamsburg, really just protesting no Stamp Act. All right, the next thing we have is Sons of Daughters of Liberty. And these were basically groups. It was a secret society organized for the purpose of intimidating the tax agents. So these were men and women. And the people of this society really did not like the customs officials. So sometimes they destroyed the revenue stamps and tarred and feathered revenue officials, as we see in this graphic image right over here. Basically, these people just wanted to oppose the Stamp Act and any British taxation without representation. Johnson Acts was really just a bunch of miscellaneous taxes on a bunch of things, but it also had a really big impact. So this was actually enacted by Charles Townsend, who was really the chancellor of the Exchequer, that's like the treasury of the British government. And basically, he wanted to tax and put duties on colonial imports of tea, glass, and paper. So it's not like they're related, they're just related because they're all commonly used products, and that would, of course, bring in good tax, supposedly. So basically, he also wanted that the taxes were to be used to pay crown officials in the colonies, so the crown officials would become independent of the colonial assemblies that had previously paid their salaries. This would make the crown officials less likely to be bribed by the colonial assemblies because before they were paid by the colonial assemblies, so they were sort of obligated to follow what the colonial assemblies wanted. But now, since they were being paid by taxes, they could really just follow the royal government back in England. And it also included something called the really just the search of private homes for smuggled goods, so it would be all an official needed to search a house would be a writ of assistance, which is just like a general license to search property, so it was really not even like a search warrant. And right over here is Charles Townsend, as you may see, your favorite British guy. This right here is Charles Townsend. So after we have letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania, and this was basically written by a guy named John Dickinson, shown right over here in left. And basically, he was a legislature and politician, and he wrote that Parliament could really only regulate commerce and argued that because duties were a form of taxation, they could not be levied on the colonies without the consent of their representative assemblies. So this is really the concept of no taxation without representation. So this is really important and central to American history, no taxation without representation, right? So he sort of like just came up with this and he wrote these letters in the like view of a farmer and this really had a big impact eventually on American history. Also, there were circular letters. These were created by James Otis and Samuel Adams, who we'll talk about later. And it basically started in Massachusetts, and it was sent to every colonial legislature. It, be it basically urged that various colonies should petition Parliament to repeal the Townsend Act so that like they shouldn't happen. And the British officials didn't like it, so they wanted the letter retracted. They threatened to dissolve the legislature and increase the number of British troops in Boston. And as a response to the circular letters, colonists did follow it. Many boycotted British goods and merchants. Many of them increased their smuggling activities. But then there was the Boston Massacre. So the Boston Massacre was an event that occurred on a snowy day in March 1770. And basically, British troops were quartered in the cities to protect the customs officials who were being attacked, sort of, by Sons of Liberty to prevent attacks. And these customs officials were, of course, collecting duties. So a crowd of colonists didn't like it, and they harassed the guards near the customs house. So the guards fired into the crowd, and it ki they killed five people, including an African-American, the Crispus Addicts, who is, as we may know today, one of the first people to die in what's known as the American Revolution. And these soldiers were eventually acquitted, so they were not charged, and they were defended by colonial lawyer John Adams, who eventually would become our second president, surprisingly. But Adams' more radical cousin, Samuel Adams, really didn't like it, and he used it to inflame anti-British feeling. So Boston Massacre, very famous newspaper article shown right over here. Committees of Correspondence initiated by Samuel Adams, we've talked so much about this guy. Basically, it was created in Boston because that's around where he lived, and it basically organized committees that would regular ex regularly exchange letters about suspicious or potentially threatening British activities. So it's sort of like the CIA of back then. And basically, it just kept people in, around the colonies in check and sort of cautious to try to not get in trouble for anti-British feelings. And the Virginia House of Burgesses took it one step further, and they, it actually organized intercolonial committees. So it sort of bonded the colonies together into this common trait. 
So, among other things, the British really liked to tax the colonists on tea because tea was really a hot commodity. A lot of people consumed it. And basically, what happened was Parliament passed the Tea Act in 1773, as we see right here. And what happened was it made the price of the company's tea, the British East India Company, even with the tax included, cheaper than that of smuggled Dutch tea, which the colonies were really consuming rapidly. And so what happened was many Americans still refused to buy the cheaper tea because it would like recognize Parliament's right to tax the colonies. So one day, a shipment of the tea arrived in Boston Harbor, but there were no buyers, of course. So before the royal governor could bring the tea ashore, a group of Bostonians disguised themselves as American Indians, boarded the British ships, and dumped 342 chests of tea into the harbor. And this was really a big event because it really angered the Brits, and then there would be severe repercussions afterwards. And many people really thought it was a justifiable defense of liberty, but others just thought it was like plain silly, like it was destruction of private property, and it went way too far. Finally, we have the Intolerable Acts, and basically these acts were a reaction from Great Britain to the news of the Boston Tea Party. It really angered the king and members of parliament, so they really wanted to punish Boston through these acts. And so they passed two acts. One was the Coercive Acts, and this was more directly related to Boston, but there was also the Quebec Act, and this really dealt with French Canada. And so basically it consisted of two acts, the Coercive Acts, this was really dealt with in America, and then the Quebec act which really was dealt with Canada. So it's important to know that intolerable acts were really two acts smashed into one. Now we can go a bit into more detail on the coercive acts. So this was really meant to punish the people of Boston and Massachusetts for their acts in the Boston Tea Party. And so it really consisted of four separate acts. There was one the Port Act which said that the Port of Boston could not be reopened for trade until the destroyed tea was paid. Also, the Massachusetts Government Act really reduced the power of the Massachusetts legislature and gave more power to the royal governor, so of course there was more British control now. Also, the Administration of Justice Act it basically said royal officials accused of crimes could be tried in Great Britain instead of the colonies, so there was that British bias. And the fourth law was the Quartering Act. It was really expanded, so British troops could now be quartered in private homes, and it applied to all colonies. Uh, right before, it wasn't always enforced and enacted in all of them, but now it was so. And just a quick note, the Quebec Act was sort of just the British governments trying to organizing the Canadian lands around France, and basically it just established Roman Catholicism as the main religion, set up a government without a representative assembly, and it really extended Quebec's boundary to the High River. And so this really angered the colonists too, they didn't like it because it really sort of just took away the lands that the colonists claimed along the Ohio River. But also, since there was no representative assembly in Quebec, it looked like that might happen as well in the colonies. And the final thing was the predominantly Protestant Americans really didn't like the recognition given to Catholicism up in Quebec. So this was also sort of like a moral hit to the colonists. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share with your friends. Thanks so much, and hope to see you in the next one.